critical thinking is one of the hardest things to define in a lot of ways. And I would challenge your listeners to go out onto the web and look for definitions and even come up with their own. And what they're going to find is a problem. Uh, it's the problem of word salad. Hey there, friend. This is Stephanie Krevins, and you're listening to the Hot Mess Hotline. You are totally in the right place if you're an ambitious leader who wants to pull off a big transformational project. We teach you how to lead with strategy, innovation, and focus for new business results, digital transformation, tough decisions, and so much more. Whatever you're working on, we've got hard-earned lessons from other C-suite executives that you can learn from too. And today's guest is Steve Perlman. More appropriately, Dr. Steve Perlman. Since 1992, he has taught critical thinking and writing in higher education, including in elite liberal arts colleges and state universities. In 2011, Steve founded one of the United States' first departments in higher education, specifically focused on teaching critical thinking skills. And he's bringing those lessons to us today. How lucky are we? He is a premier expert in critical thinking. Steve has presented at countless educational institutions, conferences, businesses, et cetera, et cetera, about improving critical thinking skills and all those ancillary skills that go with it as well. So let's dig into this conversation where Steve has two tools that you can use with your teammates as soon as you stop listening and get out of this episode. Let's dig in, my friend. Steve, let's dig right in. How do you see critical thinking, or I'm going to assume the lack thereof, getting leaders into hot messes? Well, it's a great question to start with. And really, it is always the lack of critical thinking, or at least effective critical thinking enough, because we're always doing some critical thinking as well okay. that causes these problems. And typically, it comes from different places. Because there are so many ways that our brains are actually fighting us when it comes to wanting to think well. And that's because we have, we think emotionally before we think intellectually. We think in terms of our biases and our cultures and so forth, uh, as opposed to merely looking rationally at things. For example, and this is just one example out of hundreds, there's something called action bias, for example. So action bias is a tendency to think that in a given situation, it's better to take an action than not to take an action. Oh my gosh, I have that. Oh, okay, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yes, I <Yeah>. knew it. <laughs> right, yep. so, so we're programmed to think that the taking of an action is better than the not taking of an action, or that mm -hmm. the final action that one takes is more powerful than earlier actions that were equally powerful that led up to that wow. moment, right? Okay. So that's not necessarily true in any case. In fact, sometimes not taking an action can result in better things than taking an action. But when we're faced with the choice, everyone says, well, what are we going to do? Yes. Right. Especially and, in America, man, do we love to do stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Western culture is yes. based on this idea of action as being superior to inaction. Yes. So, and sometimes it is, but we have nevertheless all of these biases in our brains that are partly baked into us for a matter of survival because very often from survival perspective action was superior mm -hmm. to inaction in many cases if the if the lion's charging you know standing there and hoping that the lion doesn't get you often isn't the preferable choice right <laughs> so we are baked in to have these biases in our brains and to think emotionally and reactively and unfortunately, we don't even know what they are. Most people are entirely unaware of them. So we have to become self-aware of these biases and learn how to counter their power on us. Yes. So I love how you frame this up from the get-go. You know, we think emotionally first and then from a, a, the place of our unconscious bias. Is there a three, four, five before we get to critical thinking? Or is there kind of that the filter that our brain uses? Well, there are lots of filters. Okay. Uh, okay. So, for example, just what we would consider to be evidence or how we look at evidence and so forth uh, is problematic because we tend to put value on information that we acquire first or early. Uh -huh. We tend to put value on information that has at one point proven valuable to us or seemed insightful, even when a context changes slightly. We still, nevertheless, cling to this kind of information and we have to learn we have to practice the skill of learning how to sift through our information again 
to reevaluate what it is that we know. Wow. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, we're constantly being weighed down by information and evidence that was at one point potentially useful, but no longer is anymore. Uh, so there are all kinds of things like that that our brains do and that they're not really constructive for us if we're going to be leaders, if we're going to be thinkers, if we're going to have a change-oriented organization and what have you. Yes. Oh, my gosh. So before we get too far into this conversation, define for us what is critical thinking. Sure. Well, I think critical thinking is one of the hardest things to define in a lot of ways. And I would challenge your listeners to go out onto the web and look for definitions and even come up with their own. And what they're going to find is a problem. Uh, it's the problem of word salad. Okay. <laughs> so critical thinking is broken down into all kinds of different terms. You're going to see terms like objectivity and logic. You're going to see problem solving. And then you're going to see all kinds of other things. You're going to see like design thinking is mm -hmm. a new way that they've come up to talk about another aspect. It's just one sliver of critical thinking, and but it's getting all this billing when really it's nothing particularly new in terms of what's happening cognitively, right? Mm -hmm. So all these terms that we throw around around critical thinking are really problematic because what they're doing is they're obfuscating for us the true nature of critical thinking. So let's think of critical thinking differently because we're never going to get to it by defining all these different terms and throwing these terms gotcha. at it. And the more terms that people throw at it, and there are thousands of them, right? Analyzing, evaluating, you know, objectivity, evidence, there are all these terms that people are going to throw into the mix and it just makes it more confusing. Let's think of it a different way without going into the process of how we teach people to think better because that I can't do in a short time. Let's talk about two ways that I think critical thinking are uh, is defined that's uh, that we can't refute. Okay? okay, we can't dispute it in any way. Yeah. The first way I like to define it is this. Since our brains are always thinking and they're doing good things to think and they're doing bad things that interfere with sound thought, yes. critical thinking is understanding the processes that our brain goes through whenever it's thinking and mastering what our brain does so as to maximize the good things that it does and minimize the negative things that it does. So really it's mastering brain function. And to do that, we first have to understand what our brains are doing when they're thinking. Mm -hmm. And then we have to identify those things, then we can start to gain control over them. The second way to look at critical thinking is a little easier and simpler and it's like this. Critical thinking is the ability to in some way transcend your existing paradigm of thought into a better one. And that's the simplest way we can think about it. Yes. Whatever you know now, whatever you believe now, whatever you think is true, to be able to in some way go beyond your own biases, go beyond your own understanding and change that thought structure to a better understanding of the reality of the problem that exists. And if we can do that, even in small measures, we've in some way transcended ourselves and therefore we've done that as a product of thinking. Wow. Wow. In my language, I would use, I would say critical thinking is almost the ultimate form of self-awareness. Well, sure. There's, but there's a, there's a difference between what people call metacognition, which is self-awareness of our thinking process, okay. which is referencing, which is very, very high up and advanced. Okay. And then also being able to reform it. Right. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. So on yes. the one hand, yeah, we need that metacognitive strength that you're referencing. It's absolutely critical. And most people have no idea what their brains did to make them do things. Right. I would ask uh -huh. any of your listeners if they really know what processes their brain went through to make them decide to listen to this podcast. Right. Do, yeah. Not not. Oh, I, oh, that was an interesting topic. I wanted to listen. But do you know what happened in your brain to make you make that decision? <laughs> right? so, so that self-awareness, that metacognition is critical for us. Yes. Yes. If we're going to be able to then also harness that power and transform it. And then that's what critical thinking is, is the ability to transform our thinking structures and control them to master them instead of just being subject to them. Wow. 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 Oh my gosh. Cause I am, I used to always think about it in reverse, meaning critical thinking was a key component of self-awareness, but what you're educating me on is, is actually that the, the opposite it's without self-awareness, you can't move into critical thinking. Yeah, right? I think they're, well, I would say they're overlapping to a certain okay. degree. Okay, all right, all yeah. right. But, okay. uh, but yeah, certainly we, if, we, if you want to change a function, you have to know what it is first. Yes. Oh, my gosh, that is true in everything. Change right. management, everything. You have to have awareness about what is before you can redesign and, and make what you want to be. Ooh, how do you... 
how do you see, because there's, I want to talk about the, the individual leader component, and I want to talk about how critical thinking does, doesn't, can, can't apply to teams. How do you see critical thinking being used in the strongest ways with individual leaders? It's a, that's a tough question because there's so much variation in it. Of course. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's hard to generalize that out because leadership involves so many different skills. Sure. But let's look at it this way. Uh, when I work with leaders and I work with executives and we're trying to work on better critical thinking with them, aside from the individual process that we take people through in order to help them become better critical thinkers overall, the first thing, and I think the biggest quality that we want to instill in people is, is intellectual humility. And as leaders, there's so much pressure to know answers. There's too yes. much, so much pressure to be able to feel as though you're leading strongly, to feel as though you're effective, to, to prove your worth as a leader. Hmm. And really, one of the strongest habits of the best leaders is listening. Uh, and not just hearing what people say, but also finding ways to probe into people and draw more out of them so that everyone's understanding the situation better. But that takes, and it's different than, let's say it's very different than just having a conversation. It's very different than just talking to people and getting some different opinions around the table. Yes. Real intellectual humility is subordinating yourself temporarily, but genuinely to the ideas of others and giving them the credit for knowing perhaps more than you do at a moment. Now, later you go back and you sift through it, but it's taking the self out in a lot of ways. And that, and that's hard to do as well because, especially as for a leader who hasn't been doing that, because people in the room will not be ready to share because they'll feel that they're being judged uh, because that's often how they've been judged a yes. lot. Yes. So they're not really venturing forth genuine ideas or criticisms or critiques or whatever until you really start to make that a comfortable environment. And so it's one thing for the leader to try to adopt it. It's another thing then to create a culture, a feeling in the room where it's actually welcome. Yes, yes. Oh my so gosh. Mm -hmm. that's, I think that's one of the most important things all leaders can start to do is embrace intellectual humility and really start to listen to their team. Yes. And what are some techniques that you teach folks to help them actively listen, to really listen, to get, to get out of their own head, their own self? And, and disconnect from that for a time so that they can connect with other people's selves. One of the best things that leaders can do in that respect that we talk about is put some cards out on the table about yourself and where your biases are coming from in terms of whatever the subject matter is that you're discussing. So you might say, listen, here's what we're talking about. Here's what we need to figure out. Here's some of my background with this. And here's yes. some of the perspective where I'm coming from. You know, I, only very briefly, I'm gonna give you, you know, for two minutes, I'm gonna tell you a couple, three, four, you pick a number, five things, no more than six, key things that are where you're coming from on it, right? So one might be, I have a history with this organization where this happened. I did this other thing that's affecting my thinking. You put some things out on the table that disarm you and show that this is who I really am about this and that mm -hmm. these are problems for me as well is that I have these biases So now help me pass them. And that's one of the most powerful things we can do is to start to show our cards, our intellectual mm -hmm. cards to people instead of clutching to them as if we're in a poker game, we don't want anyone to see it. Right. <laughs> Which is how a lot of people approach it. A lot of leaders approach it intellectually, right? They say, well, what do you guys think we should do about this problem or how should we handle this? But they keep their cards close to their chest. No, it's not a poker game. <laughs> We're not trying to win the pot. We're trying to work together here. So instead, put your cards on the table and say, here's my bias. Here's, here's my proclivity in this. And here's where it's coming from. Now that I'm, I'm telling you that because I don't necessarily think it's right. I'm telling you that because I want you to help me see, is there something a better way? Right? So here's mine. Now show me yours. Yes. Oh my gosh. This metaphor of work, team playing, being a poker game, I've never heard it put this way. And you're exactly right. That's what we do is we we hide our cards and we're like, guys, we all need to win together, but I'm going to make sure I have a flush or a royal flush or whatever the hell that top right. layer card, you know, those top hands are. But let's make sure we all win. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. So that active listening by saying, let's stop playing poker and let's, I don't know what the other, is there another game go fish or something? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I guess that's, 
<laughs> we need some kind of other analogy for it. Yeah, yeah, point, yeah, yeah. yeah. We need the positive, the positive metaphor to not playing poker together. That is, that's fantastic. And then, so let's say that the leader is able to show their cards and show their biases and show their assumptions. That's a, that's an unbelievably powerful power move in terms of leveling the power a bit in the room and saying, just because my title is bigger than yours, doesn't mean that I have all of the answers or that I know exactly what's going to happen. We need that. How in a team dynamic, just recognizing that the team as an entity is separate from the individuals that make it up. How, what are your tips or tricks or perspectives on how a team can have critical thinking after a, especially the top leader is willing to show their cards? Well, for teams, it's a problem. Uh, and it's not an insurmountable Huge. one, but, but yep. the challenge is that part of what our brains do is they work tribally. Yes. Right? We're tribal by nature. Yep. And that's a survival mechanism as well. So unfortunately, with the way that plays out in teams is very often that people are willing to subordinate their ideas once an idea gets to be a little louder than other ideas. Once an idea gets a little bit of favoritism from, let's say we have six team members and three start to really connect to an idea the other three, and this is not my opinion, this is from decision science research and so forth, yes. the other three will start to fall in line, yep. typically, right? Uh, so it's not even a majority yet. And they start to fall in line because we are tribalistic and we don't want to take on that. We don't want to change the vibe of the team. We don't want to go against the herd, yes. in other words, right? Well, now we're not thinking anymore. Thinking has stopped at that point. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we teach certain processes for actually thinking things through when we work with teams. We give them a thinking process to work through that helps to curtail some of that problem. But one thing that we can do when we're dealing with teams and so forth is to make sure every individual always has an opportunity and is required to express an idea in completion before any team decision or work is being made before anyone can say anything else. So, and the way that we have to do that because people will change. And again, not based on my opinion, this is, this is research driven. If yep. we go around the room and say, Hey, each six of you are going to give your opinion about what we should do, your initial thought about how we should approach this or what the problem is, you know, how we're going to define it, whatever the question is at the time, what happens is we get to the first person and then the second person goes and so forth. And the third person will say something like, Oh, well, I was just kind of, kind of say what the, what, you know, what, what, Fred said before, yes. I was going to kind of say the same thing. Yes. So that's fine. Or worse, they say the same thing uh, or roughly the same thing, but it wasn't really their idea. It wasn't what they were going to say. They feel a pressure if they hear what that, they might think to be a better idea. It's a, you know, they really believe somebody said something smarter. They have a pressure now to say that same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What we have to do instead is we have to have everybody write down what their idea is, okay? And then we trade and we, we just keep passing them around okay. and everyone reads them, right? So now you're locked in to yes. what your initial idea was. Now, here's the yes. thing. People will read other people's ideas. And what we find from that is that, first of all, everybody questions their own idea to a certain extent, which is great, okay? Even if they just modify it a little bit, now they modify a little bit because they're doing it in private. Right now, it's not a public display. It's a private moment when I'm reading your Stephanie. I'm reading your idea. That's right. You know, I'm thinking, okay, that's just between me and the paper now. So I have room in my brain without feeling a pressure from the group to change. The second thing is that um, even if you thought your idea was the worst idea, I might think your idea was the best idea. Mm -hmm. So when you would have subordinated your idea to the other ideas. Instead, I get to speak to and say, wow, this is the best idea. And then one of the things that we require people to do is speak to the best idea that isn't yours, right? So you're forced to do that. Or, or another exercise is laud one thing about each person's idea. And so now we have, we're starting to create a commons of thought mm -hmm. instead of operating in our side. And again, we're not playing poker anymore, right? That's right. It's, Right. So I'm not trying to get to all the chips because I had the best idea. Now we have a commons of idea. And so now we take that tribalistic nature that we have and we use it for the power of good mm -hmm. to think more instead of when it usually suppresses thought. And that's just yes. a simple example of what we do when we go in, we work with organizations and teams and so forth. Oh my gosh, that's fantastic. That tribalism that is ingrained in our limbic brain is 
unbelievably powerful. And I've seen it time and time again, leave people completely without personality, completely without thoughts of their own, completely without a perspective from their role, from their background, because they've shut off their prefrontal cortex. They go into their brain going, it's not safe to dissent. It's not safe to disagree because I'm going to get kicked out of the tribe and then the lion's going to eat me. And no one understands that that is literally what is happening in their brain. They just think, eh, I don't really care. Let's just do whatever. <laughs> what are your other ideas for overcoming that our tribal background that does not serve us in the 21st century. What are some other things we need to do? I'm sorry. Oh, for overcoming the tribalism in our Yeah. Brain? Yep. Yeah. So it's tough because, you know, then it starts to become more specific to certain situations that we're in. But I think <laughs> one of the best things that we have to do is we have to find where common ground is and use that as a starting point instead of difference. And we have to do that in business and we have to do that in our culture more as well. I wanted to end that conversation on finding common ground. I think that's an unbelievably powerful tool that you can use and certainly something that our country, our workplaces, our families, our communities need way more of. So when you feel like there's conflict, Find common ground as a great starting place. And just to recap with you, I want to share with you my top lessons learned, and I'd love to hear yours too, whatever, wherever you're watching or listening in. You know, I love particularly when Steve talked about executives having intellectual humility. You know, just the notion that just because we have some of the biggest titles in an organization doesn't mean that we have all of the answers. And, you know, the process that he helped us understand to break down some of the not so good attributes of our tribal nature and how we can use very proactive tools in our team meetings to counterbalance that. Of course, we want to use our tribal nature to our advantage, right? Like our sense of connection. You know, ultimately, every human being's deepest needs are to be seen, heard, and understood. And I think the process that he shared with us today is definitely one that does that, right? Like you've got these new ideas. You make sure that everybody contributes an idea. You switch all those ideas around, those little pieces or those pieces of paper, and everyone else reads out other people's ideas, and you have to advocate for one that's not your own. What a powerful way to get past some of our unconscious bias, some of our other limitations in our thinking, to step back into critical thinking. And then, of course, we bring it back to common ground. I want to leave you with the reminder that your teammates in your workplace are not your poker opponents. I, I still don't know yet like what the, the game is we need to be playing there. It's not go fish, but it sure as hell is not poker, right? In poker, we keep our cards close to the vest. We don't, anyone out, we don't want anyone else to see them because we think we have to win at all costs. And I've seen that in too many leadership teams and too many teams in general. So I would encourage you, put down those cards in your next meeting, share what you have, what you don't have with your colleagues so that ultimately the team, the mission, the organization can win, not just you or not just one player. All right, my friend, now let's get back to our big, transformational, important, impactful projects and problems and all the good stuff going on in our lives. And I'll see you next time.